Um, this morning, I decided I'd read our mission. We, we used to do that all the time when we voted right after we voted on it. Um, and it's good to revisit it from time to time. These are not only words that we voted on, but those we try to uh, live by every day. Our mission, working toward a more just and inclusive society. Our congregation supports spiritual growth and service with open doors, minds, and hearts. Open doors for welcoming our diverse island communities and visitors. Open minds for exploring differing ideas and beliefs. Open hearts for deepening our connection with others and ourselves. This morning, I am grateful to be deepening our connection to Reverend Janet Newton with us now for her third summer. She just reminded me of that, who has delighted us with her presence and words in our sanctuary and will surely continue this today over Zoom. Reverend Newton is a ordained UU minister who currently serves a federated church um, in Berlin, Massachusetts, originally from Los Alamos, New Mexico, where she grew up steeped in science and the natural world. For the past six years, Rev Newton has lived year round on Martha's Vineyard, the other island, with her islander wife, Maria, and their four year old daughter, Orion. Welcome, Rev. Janet, we're so happy you could be with us here today. Thank you. Let's light our chalice. Peter's going to light the chalice. Wait a minute, I'll do that. So if you can say the words that are in your order of service. Order so people can see it. Can you see it, everybody? Okay. Not as snazzy as Rev Linda's. Words, yes. Okay. With this flame. This flame. We renew, renew our commitment, commitment to justice, justice, justice peace, and, and compassion. compassion. And now we will remain unmuted, or you can unmute yourselves, and we'll sing together the affirmation uh, as printed in the order of service. time in our service to greet one another but before we do we ask if you are new here today or returning after a long hiatus if you would like to tell us or remind us of your name and where you're from we would love to greet you in good UU meeting house fashion please raise your hand or unmute yourself I don't know if we have anybody that we haven't seen that I can see so I think we're all we're all familiar to each other. So um, let's op unmute us and welcome the cacophony of greeting each other. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody. Great to morning. see you. Morning. Happy Sunday. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Hello, Andre. Rev Linda has written here don't let this go on more than a minute and a half or so. Then get the bell and ring it gently. Well, I don't have a bell, so I'm not going to ring a bell gently. But I think everybody said good morning. We have a, a fairly. Oh, there's oh, there's the Californians. <laughs> Where are the Californians? Yeah, I don't see them. Well, you know, you could have Peter Craig too. Well, Elliot's California, aren't you, Elliot? Oh yes, Elliot's <laughs> California, Elliot's right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we got two sets of Californians. That's right. This is pretty cool. Okay. Oh. Great. Great. Okay. We'll have to keep track of mileages now. Just. <laughs> <laughs> We've well, come from the furthest distance. Okay. Mileage of our electrons. <laughs> yes. 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 That's better. That's kind of too Star Trekky for me. Okay. I'm gonna let. I'm 
pretend that I'm ringing the bell gently. Oh, I have some bells. Okay, good. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looks like we don't have anybody wildly out of control here. Oh, ah. Hi. thank you. Thank you, Nigel. I'll let you take it over now. <laughs> Stepping back. Okay. Is it time for our hymn? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, our first hymn is number 298, Wake Now My Senses. And we will stay unmuted for this. And as usual, the choir gets together every week and records these hymns for us. So thank you to all the participants. And we have a couple of new ones um, who didn't make the list this week, but we'll have them on there for next week. Try that again. surprise guest reader of the poem coming up. Um, I present Parker, my, our son. Hi. Sometimes by David White. White? White? Yep. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories, who could cross a shimmering bed of dry leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests conceived out of nowhere but in this place beginning to lead everywhere. Request to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right Go away. Thank you. I think we're over to Rev. Janet. Good morning. Uh, I want to offer us this morning an embodied prayer, an embodied meditation. This was um, constructed by the Benedictine nuns of Cuernavaca, Mexico, um, and has been adapted by the Reverend Marta Valentin, who's a UU minister. So if you would just get yourself comfortable. And we begin by placing our feet on the earth to feel its energy, breathing, slowing, relaxing our bodies and opening to the spirit of life, the spirit of God. Bringing our hands to the prayer position, we place our thumbs touching the heart. We remember our connection to the heart of the sacred and all that is. 
bringing our hands down, open, palms up in a gesture symbolic of gratitude. We gratefully receive the gifts of this day, grateful for the gifts we recognize and those we don't, grateful for those who people our circle. We open ourselves to receive the gifts of this week's journey. And then touching our palms back to back our fingers pointing to the sky in a gesture symbolic of memory. We remember our past, all that brought us here, grateful for all of what has made us who we are. We give thanks for our individual and collective past. Turning our hands, backs still together, fingers moving in to touch the heart in a gesture recognizing our authentic selves. We feel our emotions, feeling where we are right now and what is happening inside, who we are without the masks. We give thanks for our authentic selves and all the feelings we carry into this moment and into this week. Extending our arms out, palms down, we reach for the good, the sacred, in a gesture symbolic of reaching for the sacred and good, our gesture, our yearning to connect, our yearning to love and be loved. Bringing our arms up to the sky, we give thanks for the air that we share, rich and poor, all of creation. We acknowledge that we do not change our air for the better and we ask forgiveness. We acknowledge the mystery of the skies, the universe, and give thanks. And coming down now, if you're able to, to touch the earth with your hands, we express thanks for her. We acknowledge that we often do not even recognize that we are walking on her. And we acknowledge that we pollute and harm the earth and we ask for forgiveness. And being back up again, standing if you're able, we bring our hands in prayer position to the third eye. We ask for vision, for clarity, and for new ways to live and love. Bringing the hands back to the heart, touching our sacred center, we feel how we are always connected to all that is, and the spirit of life. Amen. And now it's time for our middle hymn. This is the last time, uh, for a while anyway, that we'll be singing the number 1020, Woyaya. Um, next week we will change up our middle hymn and have something else. So for the last time, we are going, heaven knows where we're going, but we know within and we will get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. It will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Woyaya are the lyrics. The lyrics for these hymns are printed in your order of service, which can be found on the eblast and the website, uh, just in case you are wanting to sing along but don't have the lyrics in front of you. If you don't have the lyrics in front of you, feel free to make some up. Um, that's totally acceptable as well.
Okay, I'm putting, taking it over to Rev Janet. Just making sure I wasn't jumping the gun. <laughs> so how, how is it with your souls today? I wish that's how we greeted each other on the street. Maybe we'd get better as a society at figuring out how to describe our spiritual lives and our emotional understandings. However, it is with your soul today and wherever you are right now, at home on Nantucket or here on the other island, beaming in from far away, whether you find your mind is present in this time and space or flying somewhere far away, let's start this time together by taking a few deep breaths. This is what allows us to get more carbon dioxide into the blood, to settle our collective nerves, to reduce the stress in the room, the quieting of our brains that handle our anxiety response and synchronize our heartbeats and bring us into a cohesive sense of unity as a congregation. Please don't take this acknowledgement of the physiology of breathing as cause for alarm about my sermon, either its length or its topic manner. It is not my aim to add stress to your lives. But absent our voices together, we must take some deep breaths. Maybe you waffled on joining us this morning, unconvinced that there is value in attempting to connect in community across distance. Deep breath. Maybe your heart hurts because your island summer, the time out of time you count on to renew your spirits for the year ahead, has been sucked away by the difficulties of traveling right now. Deep breath. Maybe you were running late. You were struggling with technology. You were raging at the gods of Zoom and the devil called Xfinity or Comcast. Deep breath breath. What does it mean to be here now? Honor that. I am grateful to be among you. The Reverend Dara Kaufman Olant, who works as a chaplain at a college in California, shared this question she was asked by a student who had come to speak with her. How do I keep my heart open? The student had gotten into one of those online exchanges, you know the ones, the ones that happen in the comment sections of highly charged opinion pieces or that happen on social media walls as people buoyed by the ruse of online anonymity lob semantic grenades filled with hate. The exchange that prompted the visit was one in which anti-Semitism loomed large and the student pushed back and pushed back and ultimately was forced to wrestle with that unbearable tension. How do I keep my heart open? This is, of course, a question we've all had to wrestle with a lot more since our public squares have moved online. It's a question we have to wrestle with in our families as people we thought we knew post ideas we may find reprehensible. How do I keep my heart open in the face of hate? in the face of ignorance? How do I keep my heart open when it feels as if I'm the only one who's actually trying to keep my heart open? The question houses within it a beautiful seed of hope and a fear that this seed will not get the resources it needs to grow within a landscape of fear. What if our hearts become so hardened that they no longer have the capacity to connect? What if we can find the strength to water and sustain our hope that we can remain in powerful engagement with the world that needs our attention, the fear and the hope? We are offered the opportunity to harden our hearts so frequently in our world. Do I keep my heart open to the pain and suffering or do I allow it to break and break again? Or do I turn inward and protect what feels fragile in this world of hurt? Laura Kelly Fanucci explains our options this way. You have two choices when you feel it happening. You can let your heart stretch to the point of ripping open to the beauty and agony of living in this mortal world, or you can pull the protective shield back over the vulnerable center. You can break or you can burrow. I have done both. 
But, she adds, only one gives life. Only one option gives life. So where do we find the strength to opt for the life-giving option in the face of heartbreak in a world full of painful stories? We find the same parable told in three of the four widely accepted Christian gospels. It is commonly referred to as the parable of the sower. In it, the figure of Jesus tells of a farmer who scatters his crop seed on a wide range of soils. Some fell on the path and were trampled on, and the birds ate the seeds up before they could take root. And some fell on rocky ground, and though for a while the seeds attempted to grow, they eventually withered because they couldn't locate enough moisture to sustain life. Some fell among thorn bushes, which grew with abandon and choked out the fresh new life of the young plants. And some fell on soil that was ready for it prepared to accept life, to sustain it with nutrients and water and allow it to grow healthy and strong. Only one option gives life. This parable on the surface does not seem to need much in the way of exegesis. The standard Christian interpretation is that when the word is shared, not everyone is prepared to hear it. That does not seem all that radical. On any given day, we all experience ups and downs in our receptivity and patience, no matter how profound the message. If you catch me before coffee after a sleepless night, the ground of my heart may appear quite barren. What we are ultimately supposed to do with this knowledge though, that remains up for interpretation. The sower casts seeds into a variety of spaces that have not been properly set up to generate growth. Like the path, some ground and some hearts are hardened. Like the rocks, some ground and some hearts are shallow. Like the thorny space, some ground and some hearts are too easily distracted and crowded out by other things. But we know that soil can be altered, amended, adapted, and primed for greater health. Is the parable simply a reminder that not all seeds will germinate or an invitation to work on our own ability to receive and grow the seeds of love and truth and justice and peace within us and within our world? And if that, then how? No matter how much we may wish to be the receptive heart rather than the hard, shallow, or distracted and crowded one in a world that seems determined sometimes to make us hard, shallow, and distracted, simply wishing for openness is a losing battle. We need skills, practices to build our soil, to build our souls, such that when the opportunities arise to germinate love, truth, justice and peace arise, we are ready and willing to help them grow. Unfortunately, because our world seems determined to make us hard, shallow and distracted, we don't always even know the truth of our soil composition, our soul composition. And we've all experienced the challenge of sustaining anything over the long term that requires drawing energy from deep within us if we haven't figured out how to build up the soil within us. So I have a story for you, and this risks demonstrating my extreme ignorance of life here off the coast of Massachusetts. It might cause you to doubt my wisdom, but I urge you to find grace and forgiveness in your hearts. This is a story about my first year attempting to garden on the terminal moraine of a Massachusetts outwash plain. I am from New Mexico, as you heard in my biography, and I used to work in a garden center there. And in New Mexico, the predominant soil composition is clay and caliche. It's a word you may not even know if you've never gardened outside of New England. Caliche is this layer in which soil particles are cemented together by calcium carbonate. It's like a layer of rock under the surface that needs to be broken up if roots are going to have space to grow. So I came here, so I, when I was working at the garden center in New Mexico, the common thing that you had to do to, to uh, amend the soil so that you could grow things was to add sand because it had to offset the clay. You had to add sand and vegetal material to offset the clay and break up the caliche with a pickaxe sometimes. I came here and I wanted to start my garden and I went to the garden center and I asked them for some sand. I can't see your faces right now because I'm looking at my computer screen, but if you're laughing right now, I hope you are because 
to come to an island off the coast of Massachusetts and try to garden by adding sand to your soil, there are two things that might emerge for you. One is there's an awful lot of sand in the soil to begin with. And the second is if you need sand, you know where to go. It's not a garden center. The lesson, of course, is that we must understand our own soil composition and we must adapt our practices to the conditions in which we find ourselves. We cannot have one size fits all for all things at all times. This, in essence, is my mantra for justice work. Not everyone is ready to storm the barricades of injustice. For some, the work is incremental, minor adjustments to the pH of the environment, pointing out little truths about our world and poking at the hard pan, sometimes adding in layers of softener that we may be able to hear a message better sometimes trying a pickaxe, but always, always working with what we have in front of us as we attempt to make our world more just. In my experience, we often have access to the perfect tools of spiritual soil amendments without fully realizing that that's what they are. They might already be on our beaches. Sometimes I feel burdened and extra heavy and weighted down by what's happening in the world. And I don't always recognize the extent of that burden until I usually accidentally do something that makes me feel lighter. I might go float in the ocean for an afternoon and bring lightness into my being and only then realize what I was carrying. If your life and your mind are noisy, what practices could you cultivate that might bring quiet in? If your life and your mind are anxious, where and how could you seek out calm? Where can you find those deep breaths that allow you to recenter yourself? In the words of Robin Wall Kimmerer, it is not enough to weep for our lost landscapes. We have to put our hands in the earth to make ourselves whole again, come back into our bodies, reach out and try again in our soul, in our soil. It is not enough to note the barren places we must throw our energies into the building up of the soil the building up of our souls. Again and again, that messages of sacred hope might find better purchase there. This is what I was pondering while I experienced the vast vicissitudes of the cultural response to our coronavirus. How well do we know our own souls, our own spirits? How intentional have our lives been? Do we know what kind of soil we are dealing with? A few weeks ago, my family met up with the family of one of my daughter's preschool friends on the beach. Her mother and I got to talking across our social distance about how we've managed our time over these past few months. I shared that it wasn't until the encouragement to stay at home that I fully understood how much I had actually opted in to the frenzy of our consumer capitalist production economy, gauging my internal self-evaluations based on output on hours spent in the service of, on what I'd accomplished at the end of the day, what I'd gotten done. I hadn't realized until I was encouraged to stay at home with my four-year-old daughter that there was no place in that metric for time spent in the investigation of anthills or dandelions, and that this time fed me far better than the frenzied efforts ever could. I hadn't realized how much I'd opted into something that was not a requirement for living, no matter how much the cultural norms told me that it was. I misunderstood my soul composition. So when the inequalities built up within our cultural consciousness, how did the seeds of awareness land within us? How did we respond? How easy have you found it to feed your soul for the journey? Did you encounter people with hands over their eyes and their ears, unwilling to accept or acknowledge the truths of what was in front of them, hardened hearts and ground? Did you encounter people who built up an initial outrage that didn't contain a root deep enough to sustain itself over the disappearing news cycle? Did you encounter people with an inward directed concern that couldn't see past its own needs and truths, couldn't see beyond the my life has been hard too and all lives matter and can't we all just get along and follow the rule of law? Or did the truths, the word sown into our souls find fertile soil into which love, justice, compassion and action could flourish for the duration? 
or in David White's words, how easy have you found it to hold on to the questions that have no right to go away? How honest are we with ourselves when faced with the soul challenges put before us? The world shattering countercultural messaging of our age that mirrors the message that thousands of religious leaders have sought to impart. This isn't how the world has to be, beloveds. Let's collectively imagine a profoundly new way of being and knowing and honoring the sacred and one another. We can say this of the parable too. Sometimes we're the soil and sometimes we're the sower. How many times will we let ourselves scatter seed into inhospitable ground before we lose heart and stop trying and turn inward and weep and close our hearts? As sower, we send overtures out into our world and our family, our professional lives, some of which stick and grow for a short time some of which land on hardened soil, hardened ears, and some of which flourish. It's easy to get discouraged by the seeds that fall away to be eaten by the birds of time or laziness or intractability. How many times will I allow myself to get drawn into conversation with my in-law whose worldview differs so significantly from my own? We ask after our 1,000th Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter rejoinder, our climate crisis is real. It's not our fault. I'm going to stop trying. I'm going to unfriend. It is a tempting response. And it's not what the parable teaches us about the nature of sowing. Sometimes, the poet says, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening requests conceived out of nowhere, but in this place beginning to lead everywhere. The practices that have the power to sustain our soil for extended growth emerge from millennia of religious experience. We have access to them now. But we also have access to ways of thinking and being and practices that feed and fill us that we're already engaged with in our daily lives. It just may be a matter of locating them, setting intentions, paying attention, and pursuing them with repetition. Those are the three things that Casper Tolkien suggests are necessary for a spiritual soul building practice. Set an intention, pay attention, and do it with repetition. What intentions for soil growth, for soul growth, could you set right now? Where are you already doing it? How could you add even more nutrients and more reliable water to that practice? Sometimes, the poet says, you receive requests to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. We feed our souls without calling it that. Perhaps it is as simple as brewing a cup of tea. How might that simple act be done with more awareness of its life-giving soul swelling properties with more intention and more attention that allow us to think about where it comes from how it got processed into our space, the hands and the sweat and the earthly blessings that went into it. And now what was a cup of tea is a ritual that fills and feeds our soil, our soul. Stop, look, awaken to the ways the world is asking you to notice your soul and what it is being pulled toward and away from. Sometimes the attention means noticing the ways in which we're not in fact all right. The ways in which our souls are crying out that they are feeling hardened by the world or shallow and unable to feed us meaningfully or distracted by all the things that can draw our attention away from what really matters, our children, our ant hills, our dandelions. I know how easy it is to claim when asked how we are, I'm fine, because we are breathing when if we're being honest, we may not be fine. This is why I prefer the how is it with your soul today. It's a lot harder to answer I'm fine to that question because we're not fine, are we? Our world, our society is hurting. Our souls cry out for amendments that might help them keep our hearts open to the painful stories of the world and not harden off and wall ourselves off with privilege. None of us were fine before the coronavirus. None of us are fine in a world of cruelty, violence, indifference, and greed. But, but there is an opportunity 
in the ways in which we are not fine, in this acknowledgement of the soil we are working with, the souls we are working with. The environmental activist and author Joanna Macy asks, if we were to be given a pill to be convinced, don't worry, it's going to be okay, would that elicit from us our greatest creativity and courage? It's the knife edge of uncertainty where we come alive to our truest power. If there was ever a time of uncertainty, certainly it must be now. Maybe we are not okay, but we have done hard stuff in the past and we continue to do hard stuff and if we know how to look around us at our soil, our soul, we can get somewhere more compassionate, more compassionate for ourselves, more compassionate for one another, more compassionate for our world and seeds in our hands and souls we can endeavor to fortify for the journey. And questions, questions that even in the asking indicate a willingness, a yearning for growth and liberation, questions like how can I keep my heart open? Questions that have no right to go away. May it be so, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rev. Janet. Um, that was really thought provoking. Thank you for helping us think about how we can open our hearts and keep them open, hopefully. Um, I'm going to think about that. And thank, thanks for that sand in the garden story as well. It's great. Um, it's um, speaking of open hearts, it is time to move on to the offering. Um, as always, we ask you to be generous to have an open heart, an open purse. To keep this interconnected web alive takes all of us giving of our time, our energy, our thoughts, our spirit. It also takes resources. This is your time to contribute, to keep all that the UU Meeting House is and means thriving. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Yes, I have the wrong screen up. All right. Um, I put in the chat the website as well as the address if you would like to mail a check. Um, if you would like to do it online, you can go to the website unitarianchurchnantucket.org and up in the top right corner there's the contribute button or the text to give. I will remind you at the bottom of the website PayPal is PayPal is still an option, um, but we would encourage that you use the Tithely. When you do Tithely, make sure that you click on the drop down who you are giving it to, um, which, which section you would like to, to donate to, um, and there is the option to click recurring gift and have it happen more than once. Um, there's the down arrow where you can scroll down and finish filling out the information. So Nigel. And for the offertory today, I'll be playing an original composition. Uh, this is something that I wrote many years ago. Uh, it was originally composed for three parts, bass, piano, and trombone. I'll be playing all three parts today, um, doing something a little bit different. Uh, I've done extensive level testing, so hopefully you'll be able to hear all the parts clearly.
And now it's time for our final hymn. Uh, we'll be singing number 207, Earth Was Given as a Garden. This is a classic tune with maybe some uh, s more or less familiar lyrics. As related by Ira Bayak, apparently the anthropologist Margaret Mead was asked by a student what she considered to be the first sign of civilization in a culture. And the student expected Mead to talk about fish hooks or clay pots or grinding stones. But Mead said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur, a thigh bone, that had been broken and then healed. Mead explained that in the animal kingdom, if you break your leg, you die. You cannot run from danger. You cannot get to the river for a drink or hunt for food. You are meat. A broken femur that has healed is evidence that someone has taken up the wound, has carried the person to safety, and has tended the person through recovery. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts, Mead says. This is what we have to carry with us as we amend our soil, the soil of our world, our country, and we move beyond out into spaces of fertile flourishing. Blessed be. Thank you. Let's um, say the words that are in the order of service to extinguish our chalice. Peter will mm -hmm. extinguish it mm -hmm. and carry the flame of peace and peace love. And love. And until we, until we meet again. By Vladimir Rebikov and it is called Playing Soldiers.
Thank you, Nigel. Um, hope everybody can stay for 